Well, thanks for joining us. It is Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern time on October the 22nd. Hard to believe that um, the year is already three quarters of the way through, but um, I've enjoyed the opportunity over the last uh, six months or so to get to conduct uh, these panel discussions with um, members of the PTP team, as well as our partners and industry experts having what we think have been, you know, relevant, interesting, um, hopefully, um, you know, valuable conversations about technology and the technology impact on business. Um, excited about what we've got to bring you today. Today, we're going to talk, um, you know, probably uh, deter, de defer just a little bit away from pure technology conversation and talk a little bit more about um, kind of organizational um, acceptance and process and discipline and putting kind of the right roles and responsibilities in, in place to actually drive some of that technology adoption. So um, what we'll, you know, again, kind of the topic is accelerating results in the cloud with uh, the cloud center of excellence. And that's really gonna be the, the focus of the conversation today. Um, so to get kind of get into it, just wanted to share, um, you know, talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but certainly excited about some recognition that PTP is getting in the marketplace and um, as a result of the uh, services and consulting uh, solutions that we've put <clears throat> brought to market, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and uh, had a press release go out a couple weeks ago. Um, Ethan Simmons, uh, our, our managing partner, pictured here uh, on the cover of the CIO Applications Magazine as PTPs kind of um, recognizes the company of the year for AWS services and solutions. So excited about that, um, and obviously looking forward to, to more and better things as, as we move forward. Um, want to introduce myself as well as the team that's involved today. Um, so my name is Gary Dorheim, and I am the Vice President of Marketing and Managed Services for PTP. Um, and I've had the, like I said, had the opportunity to be able to host these events and have enjoyed um, really learning something new every few weeks as, as we've had one of these panel discussions. What we started this with is when we really kicked off this series um, back in March, it was once we all kind of got separated and we weren't meeting together um, as a group anymore. We weren't having those kind of engaging dinners or happy hour discussions. And so our concept was let's do this uh, panel discussion in the afternoon and we'll do it as a virtual happy hour. So we're not going to kill anybody with slides. Um, you know, we're going to, you know, kind of have a conversation as if we were sitting around a table um, and maybe it's in the afternoon and we're we're all having a couple of drinks. So uh, certainly not an obligation for anybody, uh, but for those of us that, um, you know, it's later in the afternoon and, and uh, kind of want to make that uh, concept um, real, um, we kind of go forward with it. And part of what we like to do is kind of share what we're having just as a um, kind of a little bit of a kind of a round table. So, um, for me today, I'm, <laughs> this is going to sound really bad, but it's been a pretty big week. So usually I've got kind of a craft beer or something like that from, I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So usually it's something from, you know, deep Ellum or somewhere in and around Dallas that, uh, that I like today. We're going a little big and, um, we're going with a Balconist Texas, Texas whiskey. So this is a bourbon, uh, started out of Waco um that has got some really really great flavors and this has turned into kind of my one of my favorite sip in bourbon so i'm going to try to keep it pretty easy um I'll, I'll pour myself a pretty small glass but but that's what i've got going on um so let's introduce the rest of the participants in the on the panel and uh mike i'll kick it over to you all right thanks gary um this is my second uh time as a panelist, so uh, today I'm going super light. As I was telling these guys, I'm just doing one of Americans, America's classic light beers, Bud Light, and uh, telling these guys I'm, I'm gonna. This isn't gonna be my my first, so I want to keep it as you know, <laughs> really side of the spectrum from Gary. So um, my role, I'm one of the founding partners of PTP, uh, focused on business development. You know. We've been at this now for five and a half years, helping customers migrate and adopt and optimize their cloud environment. So I'm very excited about this topic. So thanks for having me. Awesome. Hung. Um, so I'm drinking, um, let's see where the camera is, called Day Haze from a, a brewing company around here. 
uh, Mighty Squirrel. It's been my go-to you know, since the lockdown, so I've been drinking them. Um, it's just a session IPA. It's not that not that crazy as far as the percentage goes. Um, I'm cloud architect here at uh, PTP. You know, I help customers um, migrate to the cloud, no matter which part of the journey they're at. Um, I did a bunch of other stuff too, um, but recently definitely focus on more of the cloud. Um, awesome. Yeah. And super excited to have uh, Eric with us from uh, Cloud Checker. Eric, how about introducing yourself? Hey, everybody. Uh, Eric Morrissey from Cloud Checker. So uh, I'm a sales engineer for them. So I do uh, implementation and uh, you know, product, uh, uh, product uh, evangelism. Um, presentations like this. I am. I'm not starting my 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 drinking just yet today. I got to go pick up my three month old from daycare when I finish up here. But uh, smart. I got, a, I got a key lime. I got a key lime pie goes uh, in my fridge waiting for me when I get back. All right. Nice. Sounds like dessert. It, close enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. No, appreciate it. So. Um, so, like I said, we're not going to do uh, slides, but I did want to just frame up uh, the conversation before we kind of dive in. And so, you know, to, to reiterate, the conversation is really around the cloud center of excellence. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so uh, we've, um, you know, Cloud Checker, our partner, where um, uh, Eric is is part of the team and the platform of tools that is part of what we uh, deliver from a PTP Peak Plus services perspective, um, has done some really good research and some fantastic white papers. And if anybody has um, a desire to take a look at any of these white papers, we'd be happy to share share them with you. So reach out uh, after the panel discussion, and there's um, there's a couple of pieces that I think will be really valuable. Um, but you know, clearly from the data that's that's been extracted from the research that the Cloud Checker team has done, you know, there's an overwhelming support for you know uh, kind of the adoptance of this virtual team. And and I don't want to steal t thunder from the experts, um, but but really, you know, as we think about the change of technology, and and we've had a lot of this conversation as we talked about cloud oriented things, where you know we've moved from this world that's been a physical world world that had its behaviors and operations associated with that. And then we transitioned into this more hypervisor based virtualized world, you know, in that kind of early 2000s. And, and this was this amazing change of, wow, I can get so much better use out of my physical resources um, by virtualizing them and running applications across. So I'm not wasting physical resource. And in doing so, that changed some of the dynamics of IT operations. And so now as we shift into a, a cloud world and we have more accessible resources and more accessible services that are available to us, it becomes even more important to have that conversation around organizational adoption. Um, and so that's really what we're going to dive into uh, today. So. Um, Kind of stop, uh, stop on the sharing, and let's get into the conversation. And so, um, Eric, I actually think I want to start with you, um, and and just from the you know the highest level, can you just define a cloud center of excellence? You know what it is and kind of what it does for an organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, folks, folks might have heard this in other, um, you know, in 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 other. Um, you know, industries, the, the idea of like a cloud center of excellence, but it's basically just a cross disciplinary leadership team designed to help support an organization and adhere to best practice for, you know, for a given, in this case, for a given, for a given technological adoption. So for a cloud center of excellence, it's a set of folks usually designed to tie together and sort of unify under vision, a, a set of different teams that have you know, varying responsibilities, but ultimately will have to share uh, a set of a set of tools, and in this case, a, a set of infrastructure to accomplish common goals. But um, you know, the Cloud Center of Excellence wants to make sure that they do it um, with you know with specific goals in mind, and you know they're they're there to consistently guide as well as you know kind of set initial vision. 
And so just to kind of come on top of that and there's so there's not necessarily a a um, hard fast determination of you know what roles and what function but there are frameworks and some industry best practices in play and again reflecting back to you know the the white paper that cloud checker has done on the the cloud center of excellence there's some really good concepts around functions and then roles that are associated with that is that accurate yeah i would agree it's actually it's it's one of the interesting things about specifically i think cloud centers of excellence is that there really isn't you know there's there's no blueprint for the perfect cloud center of excellence part of that is because the blurring of responsibilities what that that just sort of natively comes along with using cloud cloud resources makes it so that there are you know, there are different folks that can you know that that can satisfy different requirements you know um there you know we see it just in terminology, you know, DevOps, DevSecOps, um, InfoSec, all of these, you know, kind of blending of responsibilities that come along with modern software development with cloud technology, I think is a perfect reflection of why, why we can, why we can use different strengths of different people to satisfy sort of a, a common goal. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, so great start, and I think that makes um, certainly makes a lot of sense. But um, you know, we work with um, some different customer sets, and and I wanted to ask Mike um, now that we've kind of defined a, a CCOE, I we can see kind of the, the the concept of a CCOE can present value to organizations in in different ways, and it different. So I wanted to talk about. You know, maybe some companies that are still at the very early stages of cloud adoption. Can you describe maybe some of the challenges that they face and where the, you know, adoption or bringing in a, a CCOE might provide some enablement? Sure thing. Uh, Eric mentioned all the different titles, you know, InfoSec, you know, DevOps, you know, cybersecurity. Everybody, you know, sometimes when you think about, any type of project, whether it's IT related, whether it's some other business initiative, Eric mentioned, you need to have kind of like an oversight committee. And, 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 and when you think about the Cloud Center of Excellence, if you don't have oversight, if you don't have span of control over all the people, all the different titles, you're, you're going to struggle because Nobody, it's all about accountability. And if you don't have somebody that's in charge that can say to all those different people that are responsible for some element of cloud adoption, that this is what has to be done. And I know that there's some obstacles that need to be overcome to get it done, but we have blessings from executive level sponsors to get those obstacles, to hop over those obstacles. Uh, that's what this is all about. It's you know, it's about uh, not just, you know, taking one application and moving it and saying, all right, we moved it off our on-prem servers and storage to the cloud and that's a win and we're done. It's about full business trans transformation, moving every app you can to the cloud because of the agility and the benefits that, that it can, that the cloud can bring. If you don't have the oversight and the span of control and, you know, the political clout, we'll call it, you're going to find yourself running into a brick wall if your responsibilities are to advance, you know, this, this cloud adoption, right? And, you know, you mentioned our customers, you know, we have large customers and we have small customers. And, you know, I can tell you anecdotally, we had a customer about seven months ago, very large financial services firm in New England who wanted to just simply move their file share application, all the file systems to the cloud because they understood based on their research, and this is IT, that they could save 60% uh, on their storage costs if they just could complete the initiative of moving the storage to the cloud, right? And with the pandemic, you know, they needed to change how their data was accessed, especially their file system. So the cloud made sense, but guess what? This company is probably 60 years old. They, they have something around 15 to 20,000 employees just to their file systems, they had 12 different IT groups that helped construct those environments over 20 years. 
Uh, and guess what? All of those employees in those 12 groups, the ones that built these environments, still work there. So the person that was given the keys to, to get to the promised land, drive, drive, drive us to the cloud, had no span of control over all those different organizations, uh, internal organizations. And every time, you know, we, we knew technically we could do what they were asking, move their file shares to the cloud. But in order to do it, we needed the cooperation of all these different groups, and there was no oversight. There was nobody to go to who had span of control. The person we were talking to is like, oh, yeah, uh, Jane Smith, who runs file sharing in our, you know, in our insurance business, she's been there for 23 years. She's not really going to be cooperative. She's not going to give me the information we need. And frankly, this person, based on what he knew of that environment, he, mm -hmm. was, he was not sure that it could be done technically. So because there was nobody in the organization that had the cloud to say, Jane, and all the other Janes that are in, you know, spread across these 12 organizations, we're doing this, the project went nowhere. That was seven months ago. They could have recognized $30 million of savings over five years, but guess what? They could never get off the ground because they didn't have a group of individuals that were empowered by executives to get things done. That's really, you know, in the larger accounts where a cloud center of excellence is super important. On the smaller scale, you know, you get two or three people. You get an you get a, a life sciences startup who hasn't even received their phase one or their, their series A financing. They know that they need to build applications, but they don't want to own servers. They don't want to own storage. They know the cloud's the right thing to do, um, so they hire somebody who has some technical savvy, uh, usually a scientist. That scientist engages with us, and we tell them, you know, we're going to start with a cloud center of excellence now. It's going to be you and, and PCP. We're going to be your acting cloud center of excellence until you guys grow into a, an organization that, that has defined roles across IT and, and business units. And, and we're going to follow best practices that have been laid out by AWS, by Google, by Microsoft, whoever the cloud provider is. And we're going to leverage tools and expertise from companies like Cloud Checker to make sure that everything's done well, uh, that your spend is controlled, that your security is, under, you know, is, is always taken into consideration. So, you know, the point I'm trying to make is the Cloud Center of Excellence doesn't necessarily just apply to the big companies. It doesn't just apply to the small companies. Everybody could benefit from, you know, the, the development and creation of a cloud center of excellence. And, and frankly, like before this, this, this call, I was like, oh, I'm going to do some quick research. I Google cloud center of excellence. You know how I know it's important to the public cloud providers is the, the top five searches. It was AWS. It was Microsoft. It was Google. It was Accenture and Gartner talking yes. about CTO. Yeah. It was the the players that care the most about moving applications to the cloud and the consultants that those players pay to say that this is really a good idea. It's a good idea because the overall experience will be better if you have a CCO CCOE in place. So uh, I'll, I've, I've talked for a while, but that's, uh, that's hopefully that answers your question. No, that was really, really, really helpful. And I think in some some situations we tend to, you know, we think about, you know, this in terms of companies that are already, you know, either heavily in the cloud or fully adopted in the cloud or to the, your point of some of the early stage life sciences companies that we work with a lot, they just kind of born in the cloud, they immediately shifted all their data there. And so for them, it really becomes around some of the things that we'll, we'll continue to talk about today, which are, you know, control and cost optimization and, and governance and security. The, the concept of the CCOE for the organization, you know, like the, the large organization that you're talking about that's kind of at that's early stages that has so many large legacy applications that's going to take a lot of heavy lifting. It's that how do we break down these organizational silos and create a kind of a cross departmental organization? And again, you used a great word of accountability, not just you know, people are going to show up, but but they've got the accountability to the overall organization that that they're in this for a larger, you know, not just for their departmental interest, but kind of for the overall interest in adoption. And why is that adoption important? Acceleration, time to market, you know, speed of application development, all those things that, you know, we've got um, 
you know, large organization that we uh, work with on the managed services side that's in the you know insurance industry. And it's a similar model to where, you know, the 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 speed at which they need to deploy applications and allow tools to, you know, the users of their consumers of their insurance just has to move faster and faster and faster. And that can't be done um, as as quickly in, in their uh, legacy application. So so we definitely have an application, a different application, depending on on customer size and i think that that was an important thing to touch on um i'd like to dive into a little bit more on the roles and eric you touched on them but maybe if we could if we could go to that into a little bit more detail because you know what what mike brought up you know we've talked about applications and we've talked a little bit about security and we talked about some financials um you know, I think there's maybe a combination of there's there's roles in the CCOE and then there's, you know, what are those job titles in the organization that would map to those roles? And let's just, you know, maybe give, help paint a little bit better picture for our audience and, and what that looks like. I would say the most um, the, the, the most common folks that that I end up working with that are, you know, that are really deeply entrenched in this kind of stuff end up being. Um, somebody in that DevOps space, so somebody, somebody, somebody with like an operations manager title, somebody with a, um, somebody with a development manager title. Um, depending on the kind of applications that you're running, you know, your your DBAs, your network engineers, um, then almost certainly somebody with the word security in their in their job title, and then on on the other side, somebody with the word finance in their job title. Um, I think you know that that combination, folks that are folks that are responsible for the the you know the application stack itself, and you know flanked by the folks that are responsible for the security of that application stack and the cost of that application stack. I I, I think really well kind of rounds out the the responsibilities that are particularly I, that carry the most weight. I would say within mm-hmm. with within a CCOE, um, the folks that are probably doing the most you know, the most sort of cooperation and collaboration, the most sometimes compromise, um, but the folks that are really, you know, most key for enabling the other teams to perform the functions that are required of them. Gotcha. And then I, I would assume, and again, this is me asking the question that, you know, organizationally, depending on how you're structured, you may have you know, business line leaders or certain elements of infrastructure leaders. And it's really kind of Kind of doing a little bit of soul searching on the own your own organization on on what roles need to be accurately or effectively represented to to both support kind of the demands of you know departments or organizations, but but still facilitate as as a valuable member of that CTOE team. I think so, and I, and I think you know that that idea of um, sort of customizing around um, organizational differences, especially like hierarchical differences, um, organization to organization, is um, is is key to that concept of of enablement. Um, you know, you're looking to align an organization around specific goals, and so I think for that purpose, you need you need folks from a lot of different places within an organization. You know, it it can't just be um, you know, a, a set of uh, a, a set of folks with you know C's in their titles. I I I think, um, I think you you necessarily need to pick folks with, um, you know, with areas of expertise that um you know, that that are you know that are closer to the technologies that 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 you're you know that you're working with. And and I think that 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 comes with a very close analysis of. Uh, of the structure of an organization and and making sure that the different pieces are well represented. Yep. Okay, so let's take the, the let's take the next step. So we're we've kind of we've addressed some personnel. Um, you know, we've, we talked kind of process in in departments, and now we'll get into a little bit more of the data data driven decision making and and how that is empowered through you know tooling and, and applications. And so. Um, Hong, I want to kind of go to you about, you know, kind of the information and visibility to to empower that team. And so your role um, at PTP, as you said, as a cloud architect, um, you're helping our cloud customers with that that visibility through tools, platforms, um, you know, cloud checker in specific is, is kind of one of the key components to our, our platform. What, you know, at a higher level, and we'll get into some detail, but 
you know, what's the information that, that this team can be looking for to really help drive, um, kind of drive the power of the CCOE? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Mike and even Eric mentioned, you know, like, I think tools that can help you give you information on, on application or services that are ready and suitable for the cloud. You know, that's important, uh, like applications that, you know, have little to no integration of existing system, that's great candidate. Uh, or those that have fluctuating workloads, that's also good. You know, that you can, that's benefits from the scaling features that the cloud offers. Um, you know, once those applications are identified, you know, customers takes, takes those uh, requirements and then figure out which cloud vendor fits best. You know, it might be one single cloud. It might be, you know, makes sense to go multi-cloud because different cloud vendor have different strengths. Um, you know, and then, once they're in the cloud, you know, tools like Cloud Checker right, have um, extremely important keeping tabs of, you know, all the assets, monitoring um, resources that are, you know, active, some are unused, some maybe simply just needed uh, to be uh, sized correctly. Or, or I've heard recently on an AWS podcast that not just right sizing, but right typing, you know, on storage is also important. Um, and let's not forget about security, you know, almost every one of us that have mentioned the word security, you know, it's extremely important to have tools that give you the visibility on, on how secure your cloud environment is, you know, not leave your infrastructure vulnerable to attacks. Great. So you hit on a number of things. I mean, similar to, you know, how we kicked off with Mike, it was, you kind of start at the the migration standpoint on the what makes sense to migrate, um, what applications can be in that detail. So I think that was important. And then as you know, as things are moving over, it's it's that kind of control and visibility and security. And um, I think that that makes a, a lot of sense. So we're really obviously have to think about it as a, a full life cycle. It's it's not necessarily just the when you're there in the cloud, but but certainly you know how applications are getting there and how businesses are making that determination. And is it a lift and shift or is it a build new or write new uh, code, et cetera? Um, so lots of considerations. And again, that's, you know, um, that's why a larger team needs to be involved. And if, if, if a team that's not accountable isn't in place, then the inertia of some of the complexity then takes over. And that's why some of the larger companies just don't move um, because they almost can't because of that inertia. Um, and so with that kind of larger company, smaller company conversation, um, you know, Mike, you talked to us a, uh, a little bit about obviously large organization that was kind of challenged and then, you know, the, the life sciences organization, but, but just in your experience and your conversations is, is the CCOE just something for larger companies? Does it have an application in smaller companies? What's your thoughts in terms of how it's used? I know you touched on it a minute ago that. It can start small and grow, but maybe can you expand on that just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the idea and the value of a CCOE is relevant and important to every company that's going to consider and, and or that's going to move to the cloud or if they're already there, it's important. Uh, so, you know, we, PTP, when we are working with customers, big or small, there are some that say, you know what? We, we already spend 100000 a month. We already have moved, you know, countless, you know, mission-critical applications to, the, to, to AWS. We'll, we'll just use that as an example. We aren't governing this environment. We aren't optimizing this environment. And quite frankly, I don't have the, the ability to build an internal team to take ownership of doing that. So companies that are in that situation will, will leverage an MSP. Right, a, a company like PTP, or there are many others out there. Mission is one. Prevo, which was just bought by Navisite, is one. Rackspace. These are companies that actually will integrate themselves into a, a you know a small company, a large company, any company that is is committed to the cloud and has already moved applications there can benefit from partnering with an MSP, build out a CCOE with that company, right? Um, so, you know, the answer is, if you're looking to optimize, if you're looking to save money, if you're looking to make sure your apps are secured, if you're looking to make sure that um, 
process, internal process for spinning up applications in AWS, Azure, or Google. It, it, it has eyes on it. Like it, it's just not that shadow IT that's just growing uncontrollably. Then, then taking the 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 mindset of the cloud center of excellence critical. Right? You can't can't let too much time go by because at some point. I've seen it happen before that they called it the boomerang effect where a company went all into the cloud and said, we moved so many apps there, but the value that we're getting, yeah, we're a little bit more agile, but we're spending so much money and we have no real control over what's going on. So what do they do? They rip it all back and put it on prem. If you want to avoid that, no matter the size, no matter what size you are, how much you have in the cloud, you have to take the, the initiative to, to build a CCOE, whether it's by doing it internally with your own people, partnering with a, an, uh, an MSP like PTP. You know, my, my advice and recommendation is to, to go all in on, on uh, the, the value of CCOE and putting one together for yourself. That's, that's great. Um, so I want to get into a little bit more on the tooling side. Um, and so, Eric, I'm going to I'm going to come back to you. Um, so this is a, you know, you live in cloud management every single day in terms of your role with cloud checker. Obviously, we're very, very familiar and we live with the cloud checker platform every day, but would love to just have you explain in a little bit more detail, you know, how how that tool, how that platform is really leveraged by, you know, Cloud management organizations in a in a CCOE in this sense, um, you know what what's kind of the horsepower that that really uh, really has an impact. Yeah, I think the I think there, there's there's a couple key components, and 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 the first of which is that you know the what what becomes difficult about um, about managing or, or maintaining visibility into cloud environments is that the paradigm shift from you know traditional IT where an inventory was, you know, a list somewhere that was updated every time some, you know, some piece of technology was was acquired. Um, you essentially can can never stop taking inventory of of cloud resources, and so this idea of maintaining visibility and and accessing and and, and making available the data points that are necessary for ongoing, you know, intelligent decisions about cloud infrastructure. Um, you know, you you have to have something that is continuously gathering information, um, and that's not to say that that necessarily is is the only challenge. I mean, all of the cloud providers, in one way or another, are um, are helping out with this. You know, everything everything speaks API at least to a certain degree. Um, there are tons of logging mechanisms. Um, you know, so for cost data and for activity and for and for utilization metrics. So step two, after gathering that stuff as as frequently as you need to, just to stay on top of how thing, how, how ephemeral things are in the cloud, is actually teasing information out of that. And that's that's I think cloud checkers, you know, superpower, is making sure that those those specific data sets turn into turn into both you know, presentable reporting that that assists with enablement and assists with um, proper communication between teams, but also guides action, you know, in, in one way or another can actually help, you know, an individual, a team either measure against specific, um, you know, specific goals or, or, or specific visions for, for, you know, for their deployment, or um, e even in some cases, patch, patch up gaps in, in, in expertise. Um, you know the, the the tool is is what makes sure that the data that's out there is is truly sort of weaponized or or, or turned into um, in one way or another turned into something beneficial for the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, completely completely agree. And you know, just thinking about the you know the use of it and. You know that we had a conversation uh, probably a couple months ago with um, uh, Eric Zimmerman, who's part of the life sciences practice team of AWS, and we were talking about data accuracy and data visibility as its importance to kind of the data science side. Um, and as you're talking about 
cloud checker and, and how it's used by a team and tools, I'm thinking about that parallel because in a different sense, it's, it's less about the data of the analytics applications for life science, but it's more about you know, the visibility and the accuracy of the data on just that platform. And because of the dynamic nature and the scalability and the fact that resources can be turned up and turned off, there has to be some control mechanisms around that. So providing control mechanisms with the visibility um, and then trusting the data that you're that you're reviewing is accurate is critical. Um, and and I completely agree. And having that you know that at your fingertips is is imperative. Um, I completely agree that you always have to be inventorying, um, which I think is a great uh, segue to um, to Hong and to kind of go down on that a little bit deeper. Um, so you know, I'm, I've I get to work with with Hong frequently. The services that <clears throat> we deliver at PTP that we call our Peak Plus Control Services really leverage. Uh, cloud checker and we're helping provide these these kind of guardrails for our customers. We're a, a friend of the CFO because once we understand budget and budget constraints, then we can make sure that we stay within those rails. Um, we're a friend of the CISO because when we're looking at you know what policies do they have from a security perspective we can validate that those are being adhered to at any given time um, and then intelligence just into the the cloud owners in terms of you know what's usage and what's consumption and what opportunities do we have for either you know cost savings or right sizing or, or manage the environment so so we get to to work a lot together like that um, but um, i was wondering if you could go a little bit deeper and just maybe talk about the few areas inside that application, whether it's reports or screens, or when you're living in a cloud management tool like that, what's the data points that are you're going to gather and what are the areas, maybe a couple specific areas that you found that have been most valuable to either you or the customers that you're working with? Sure, yeah, I think, um, you know, like, like what Eric, going off of what Eric said, you know, that what's great is with Cloud Checker, you know, and, and just all that data, but you know, it. it Kind of guides you, you know, to take a certain action, or at least it sets a reminder um, with, with some of its reports. Uh, I mean, I'm in, I'm in there almost every day. Um, it's many great areas, but but I'll highlight a few. Um, first, I would say is you know the best practice on um, checks. Um, you know, Cloud Checker does a great job having that on the homepage is one of the first thing you see uh, on an account on a bunch of accounts. Um, takes a snapshot of you know how how the account is configured each day. Um, from a security uh, and availability standpoint or cost and usage. Um, you know, what's great is it's a single page, either of, you know, a group of accounts uh, across different business units or all your accounts. It's nicely color coded showing you what needs more attention. You know, if you have a resource open to the public that you're unaware of, you probably want to work on those first. So um, it does a great job of, you know, Bright, bright red color, you know, telling you that you should kind of <laughs> take action on that. Um, uh, then, you know, then you you went into some of the cost savings, cost uh, reporting, um, alerting piece. You know, Cloud Checker nicely lists these recommendations. I would say of purchasing reserve instances, um, what resources are not provisioned correctly, what's left idle, or simply just not being used. Right? Um, you can set alerts on spikes you know on your spend or or like i mentioned resources you know that are that were active that went idle you want to be alerted on that stay on top of it or just you know general account how it's trending you know either up or down um but if you need to go get to the bottom of of a particular cost of spend cloud tracker can do that as well you know it, it can get very granular with with their custom reporting I mean, all these are cost savings and cost relating information any business would, would be happy to know about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you're a customer looking to achieve compliance, a sec a cloud security compliance, or just staying compliant, um, Cloud Checker you know, offers over, I think, 30 regulatory standards, um, including you know, from HIPAA, the PCI DSS, and other compliance frameworks. Um, it's mm -hmm. nice because it, it provides like a checklist of areas that you're lacking that requires attention. Um, 
and 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 it also indicates like how far you are um, from meeting that compliance. Um, I mean, there's so much more, but those are just just a few that yeah. I to talk about. No, that's helpful. And and to reiterate, this is not a. Um, I mean, obviously, Eric's with uh, uh, Cloud Checker, but this is not a. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a Cloud Checker commercial, but it is about how do you empower this organization and how do you empower adoption and business acceleration. And it is with intelligence and it is with tools, and that's you know obviously what we um, work together here to be able to provide. And um, you know, I'm I I frequently. <laughs> I don't know if forget is the right word, but um, sometimes as we're providing some, you know, they, they could go grab some of this information. And the reality is time is of the essence and um, all of us have got a lot on our plates. And so to the extent that we can automate or provide that visibility easy or in for our sake, in some of these uh, situations, provide that function um, for somebody, it's it's really, really, really helpful. And so as we talk about, um, you know, those roles that were critical for a CCOE, and then we talk about some of the pieces of information that we've discussed today around, you know, cost and inventory and assets and uh, security and compliance. And those are all data points that that team's going to need um, to be able to help steer and make decisions for the organization. So um, appreciate that, um, Hong. And I was just thinking, as you were saying that, um, just uh, what, two days ago, you know, we had an alert for an organization for a customer of ours, and they had, you know, just a spike on one day of somebody on their DevOps team was running a job and it kept triggering errors and it kept um, those errors kept repeating themselves and it was sending a bunch of logs to CloudWatch and that ended up costing, you know, could have cost them like a thousand dollars in those. But, you know, you catch it before it gets out of, out of control and you realize what's going on. And that's, again, the power of being able to provide some alerting and monitoring and, and put the guardrails on. So very, very helpful. Um, we had another client uh, that big user of scripting, you know, to be able to spin up instances and and spin them down. And when you write a script, it's it's a person in the script, right? And sometimes they can do it incorrectly. And, and when they do that, some, you know, what happens with this one customer not long ago, same type of scenarios, you know, t one keystroke turned the instance type into one that cost 60 cents an hour to one that costs $16 an hour. And when you're spinning up a thousand instances that are the same, that one error could cost the company, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And thankfully, you know, because of the the tools that the CCOE put in place, they were able to, to nip it in the bud and then, you know, have the documentation to go back to the service provider and say, hey, this is an error. We're a good customer of yours. You know that we weren't leveraging that compute power for anything beneficial to our business. Can you give us a credit? We go in and with the CCOE individual responsible for governance and finance and fight the fight and get the credit back. In this case, it was nineteen thousand dollars. You know, so Ooh. another bit of having an, a team in place that's that's looking at your environment, making sure nothing gets missed. You bet. Well, that's that's real money. Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, Mike, you when you kind of entered, you introduced yourself, you obviously founder of um, partner of PTP. And when you started, I mean, I've I've um, uh, remember having the kind of the first conversation with you when you talked about that. But, you know, you mentioned, hey, Purchasing an IT is different. You were at a, a larger, you know, larger VAR system integrator. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, back in the day, it was like, hey, you knew about all the big data center deals because it was EMC and it was VMware. And then you started realizing that you weren't involved in those deals anymore. And you've actually written a really good blog on that that we've got on our blog page probably about a year ago or so. Um, you know, just kind of referencing that paradigm shift from you had these, you know, whether you call it shadow IT or you had these kind of pop up cloud organizations. So having, you know, kind of having created that that foundation, long foundation for this question of we know that 
organizations are having people pop up cloud instances because they don't want to involve IT because they don't want that. They don't want to be slowed down. They want to move their initiatives faster. So kind of compare that with how can you bring in a CCOE to not slow those guys down, but provide, you know, the 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 oversight that those organizations need. How do you how do you think we can strike that balance? And and how does visibility and, and tooling have an impact on that? It's a good question and, and it's it's all about communication. I think um, DevOps and development teams, even you mentioned when VMware and virtualization became, you know, the technology of choice and it just made so much sense. It all that all started in the, the the test and dev world, right? Cloud started there as well. Um, you know, this, you know, if I look at our customer base, the largest spenders are the ones that have significant development teams, and the folks that we have relationships with based on our heritage, they're in IT, and the IT folks don't necessarily spend too much time or hadn't in the past spent too much time with the DevOps and the development and the code writers and the people that are, you know, application focused. Um, what I've seen with, you know, with the adoption of, of cloud centers of excellence is when you explain to these, these, these uh, software developers that, you know, we're not slowing you down, it has to be a very candid conversation because for whatever reason, over the last 20 years, there's just been this dichotomy between IT and, and development. Um, but but I think of one of our customers, Altair, and the director of cloud engineering expressing to us, it is so hard. Altair is a software company. They're continuously coming out with new versions of their products. They probably have four or 500 developers. The IT team over the last two and a half years has made such a significant effort to get to know these people, you know, and 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 we support the IT team around knowledge about cloud and the tools that can help, you know, keep these these developers inside the rails that the business needs them to stay in. So it's it's a big effort, you know. I think Hong, myself, and some of our other cloud architects, we have to have weekly calls just to maintain and and um, and monitor what's going on. You know, educate and coach the IT leaders, this director of cloud, you know, operations, educate them on what things these de these development folks are gonna wanna hear from us so that they don't think that we're impinging on their ability to just, you know, do what they wanna do from a development standpoint. Um, so it's, it's a big effort, but it's an effort that companies, you know, across the board that are doing well in the cloud that are, you know, seeing growth in their business, they're, they're making the effort and they're succeeding and they're using tools from Cloud Checker and showing, you know, the, the dev teams, you know, dashboards that say, hey, look, you're spinning up an M4X large when you could be spinning up, you know, a, a, a nano instance that's going to cost significantly less. You don't have to provision things the old way where you have, you know, 15% utilization of the CPU. You can really get it to a red line. You, you have to take the time to develop the relationships, you know, IT to, to development and software orders and make sure that, you know, you can, you can communicate without there being any type of, you know, animosity because they think they're being, you know, impinged. So uh, it, it takes, it takes a, a, a very strong uh, effort with with uh, empathy and you know, you really have to you know from an IT perspective uh, go in and eat a little bit of humble pie um, but if you make the effort you show them the tools you you leverage people like like PTP and cloud checker to to help you you know deliver the message from an IT perspective it's a win-win and and uh, everybody on both sides are happy right and the businesses they flourish because of the adoption of cloud, right? So, hopefully that answers the question. I was, that one kind of came at me out of the blue, but did my best. <laughs> no, that was great. And it's, uh, I I always think whenever I'm thinking about cloud adoption, I know this is kind of silly, but uh, with great power comes great responsibility. What is that? Was that Spider-Man? Um, yeah. 
and it's it's true. It's like you've got access to these resources that are unlimited. They're easy to use. It's easy to adopt. But but holy cow, can you create you know security holes really quickly? Uh, can you create cost issues uh, really easily, et cetera? And so that's I think it takes. I mean, frankly, CCOE is about leadership. It's about an organization saying that this is where we're going and we're creating this team and we're going to make them accountable. Um, but then with that leadership and with that team, it comes information and visibility and, and the power to make those decisions. Um, so no, I thought I thought that uh, was a great answer. Um, I want to address happen. one thing. Go ahead. It doesn't happen overnight, but it's totally worth it if you just, you know, if, the, if you can convince the IT folks who we know to to kind of approach it in a certain way, you know, they they became you know they become more valuable. They they're all worried about job stability. You know, when technology changes, IT folks get nervous that they're going to be rendered, you know, worthless to the company. But if you, you know, empower them with knowledge and with tool sets, you know, they can continue to show value, you know, day in, day out. Um, but they have to always think about their customer and their service. Most IT folk, uh, folks are service folks. So. For sure. I am um, always surprised when we do these. I I'm kind of going through, you know, having uh, asked a number of questions, and then I, I look up at the top, and it's like, oh my gosh, here we are, four minutes to the top of the hour, and it just it it blows by. Um, and I always really enjoy the conversation. Um, I know there's probably a couple things that maybe we missed or thoughts that you had that you um, wanted to share. Um, obviously, we want to thank our our attendees for being with us this whole time, but to the panelist team, anything that either I didn't ask you or just thoughts that you'd have that you'd want to close with before we uh, adjourn? Who wants to go? We cover it all. <laughs> I'll just say uh, thanks. Thank, thanks for having me. Um, you know, uh, I, I think this is an important conversation about, you know, about, about any technological adoption to do it within to do it with intention and to do it with, um, you know, with, with a thoughtful approach, um, and, and, and to make sure that the folks that are responsible for that adoption are properly enabled. Um, and cloud is no different. It's, it's funny that you said that Gary about, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. It felt like, it felt like all of us were making some reference to that at some point, you know, all of these terrific things that the cloud. Terrific opportunities that the cloud affords us all also operate or opens up all of these little pitfalls. But I think, you know, folks like folks like you guys, you know, you're, you're, you're the ones really driving the comfort with. With the adoption by, um, you know, by, by focusing on, on that, you know, on, on that vision. So thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I would uh, say that um, if, if you're on this call with us today and you're. Trying to figure out how to, to best manage your cloud adoption, your cloud strategy. Um, you know, research, you know, cloud centers of excellence. Google, you know, you go to those five searches that I, I mentioned earlier. I read all of them and they're all very relevant and they're all aligned with what we're saying here. And uh, it's a it's a people process and product or tools uh, conversation. And and if you're a a mid tier manager or an admin and you're tasked with rolling out an app in the cloud, I would early on raise your hand, tell your boss and your boss's boss that if, if you're not thinking about a CCOE uh, out of the gate, you're probably doing the business of disservice. So I'll leave with that. Awesome. Anything for you, Hong? No, I'm good. I think, you know, I, I agree with what they said. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, from, from, uh, I guess a tooling standpoint, which, you know, I'm, I'm most familiar with, um, you know, nothing, uh, is perfect, but, um, there's always these one offs that you might want to need to go back to your, to native tools for, but I think, you know, not to be marketing cloud checker, but, you know, cloud checker would, would probably, um, it's going to have you covered for most of, most of it. Yeah. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you guys for taking the time to get it today. It's it's a good discussion. I love um, when we kind of uh, thread through the technology with the team and the process and, and bring it back to the business. So um, to the attendees, thank you once again for joining us. Really appreciate it. To the
the concert that you're going to this evening and then check us out on ptp.cloud we'll be doing another panel discussion probably here in the next couple of weeks hope everyone has a great rest of your day take care thanks everybody yeah, thanks